Which brings us to uh, action item 5.1, a proposal to relocate TKK from ECDC to Village, Maine at 2020-2021 time frame. As I just read the instructions, let me get us how many cards we have here. So I've got eight cards. Let me count them one more time just to be sure. Two, three, four, seven, eight. I had eight cards. Any more uh, yellow cards on item 5.1? Going once, going twice. All right. Uh, board members, I'll ask your uh, forbearance then. If I have eight cards times three, that'll be 24 minutes. That's a little beyond the 20. If that's all right with the board, I'll go ahead and uh, take three minutes from each member. Uh, please keep your comments to three minutes. If at the end of three minutes you're still speaking, you'll hear me say, please summarize in the next 10 seconds. And after that, uh, I'll just ask you to uh, have a seat. All right. And once again, these are in the order that were received. No, no precedence has been given to them. Uh, first is from uh, Ms. Jacqueline Hart. Ms. Jacqueline Hart. <clears throat> Hello. I am here today to speak as a parent of two transitional kindergartners enrolled at ECDC and on behalf of my fellow parents and f of future and current students who, like me, are strongly opposed to this proposal. I also speak on behalf of the children too young to be able to speak for themselves on this issue. At this time, I would like to ask anyone present tonight who is against this proposal to stand. The school board website states that the governing board is committed to transparent operations, data-driven decisions, and active comprehensive oversight. This proposal has not been transparent from the start. The minutes from the special meeting, a meeting that was barely advertised, stated that a formal proposal would be submitted for the board to review that would include realistic timelines, master schedule, and maximizing space. The proposal presented does not include any of these requirements. It covers the unsubstantiated pros of one side only. How can you make a decision that impacts nearly 900 current students and unforeseen numbers of future students using a three-page document? Where are the other proposals to weigh against this one? Why has the traffic study not been publicly shared? What is the impact on Village? It is an unbalanced document, not a proper report, and it is certainly not transparent. This proposal is not data-driven. There is zero data provided in this proposal. This proposal is full of unsupported blanket conclusions, financial and timeline estimates based on belief and examples, not fact. There have been no formal surveys issued to impacted parents or the community to gather real data. The last sentence of the proposal is a joke. The fiscal impact on this initiative has yet to be determined. How can a proposal offered with the goal of alleviating a financial deficit be approved without comprehensively reviewing a thorough financial analysis? This proposal is not even close to being comprehensive, nor has it been openly communicated. The FAQs distributed to parents last week contained one-sided and in no way comprehensive spun information with many questions not even directly answers. This is a half-baked proposal. It is not a clear plan. How can we, as parents, trust a school board that does not live up to its own principles? ECDC is the gem of your educational system. It is perfect for our youngest, most vulnerable students. Your mission statement is to inspire, innovate, and create limitless opportunities to thrive. This proposal is not inspired, not innovative and puts definite limitations on the opportunity for our children to thrive. Please don't do this. Live up to the norm statement presented in the special meeting slide deck and your LRP guiding principles and put students first, always. Thank you. Second card is uh, Miss Katie Iwashita. Did I say that correctly? <laughs> Sorry, I'm pointing this up on my phone. Hi, Mr. Mueller, school board members, thank you for having me. Um, I'm a parent of a second grader TK student and an eight-month-old who will be entering the school district in the coming years. I would also like to voice my opposition of the proposal to move the TK and kindergarten classes to Village. 
When I first heard of this proposal, I thought, wonderful, one drop off and pick up, makes my life easier. But the more I processed the proposal, I realized what all of our students would be giving up in order to make this happen, and I cannot see how the pros outweigh the cons. ECDC was created as a direct result of overcrowding at Village. Have the numbers of Village decreased since then? Oops, sorry. Um, why would we take away a location that was designed specifically for the educational and developmental needs of this specific age group? Have their needs changed? I second the items that were just spoken and would also like to reiterate my specific concerns about overcrowding, larger class sizes, and the safety at drop-off and pickup. Drop-off and pickup is a logistical nightmare at Village Elementary. There's not ample parking nor a drive-through area to drop and pick up without getting ticketed. ECDC's location at the end of the street with drive-through drop-off and ample parking makes the location so much safer for our youngest students. I see kids on a frequent basis nearly being missed by cars in front of Village as parents, larger students on bikes, and high schoolers rush through the stop signs on 6 to make their destination. I often have to drop my 8-year-old off a ways down the road and cannot imagine doing this with my younger child. How would adding upwards of 100 students, the smallest ones at that, be safe for anyone? If drop-off and pickup is staggered, as the proposal suggests, I don't see how this is more beneficial than what we currently have set up for the two different locations. Will there be a before care option for parents who want a single drop-off time, and what will the cost be associated? It seems as if so many of these details have not been thoroughly explored, and I don't understand how a vote can be cast until these details are ironed out. My kids are now third generation Coronadans. Uh, four years ago when my husband and I talked about relocating back to Coronado, I was very hesitant, primarily because the schools where we lived were exceptional. They had 10 out of 10 rankings with very low student to teacher ratios. My husband promised me <laughs> that the schools in Coronado were amazing, that he loved his experience here, and that people move to Coronado and spend millions of dollars to live here because of the schools. Village Elementary currently has an 8 out of 10 ranking, and some of the hot topics under any school reviews tend to be based upon class size, overcrowding, and safety in the schools. I can only imagine that these changes would ne negatively infect this ranking. I ask you please to vote no on this proposal. Please vote no for the well-being of the students, the teachers, and the community. And for the well-being of my husband, please let him be right. <laughs> Just this time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Jill Proctor. Not made for tall people. My name is Jill Proctor, and I have four children attending Village Coronado, or Coronado Schools. California's Brown Act states, the people in delegating authority do not give their public servants the right to decide what is good for the people to know and what is not good for them to know. The people insist on remaining informed so that they may retain control over the instruments they have created. Here we have been given notice that the board will be voting on a proposal today. The specifics of the proposal, however, have not been released. That's because they don't exist. There's no real plan yet. Rather, the, vote, the board is voting on an idea, a shell. This does not comport with the intent of the law. Yesterday, I went, met with Mr. Mueller and two board members with questions regarding this proposal. I asked how traffic concerns at Village would be addressed. They didn't know. They mentioned that the police department has already done a traffic study on ECDC and Village and found both campuses lacking. They think that by combining the two sites, traffic will somehow get better, not worse. There's nothing to support this assumption. No traffic schedule, no bell schedule, nothing. The district hasn't told us how it will add 150 more students to the lunch area, playgrounds, library, and ACE programs without reducing use of these, pro these resources by other students. Nor do we know why Village is better equipped now than it was 15 years ago to house all TK through fifth grade students. It was made clear to me yesterday that this proposal will likely pass today because the district needs the money and cannot spend money developing a plan unless it knows for sure that the plan will be implemented. Here's my question. If the school board truly values transparency and community input, why doesn't it first vote on a proposal to have the district put together a detailed plan? Now, yes, that proposal would need to lay out costs associated with the planning phase, which is also conspicuously absent from the materials we have today. Then, 
after it has had an opportunity to analyze all the implications of moving 150 students to Village, the board would vote on whether the pro proposal should be implemented. If it's truly as great a plan as the district makes it out to be, then surely it would pass and no money would be wasted. True, this would require one additional level of public disclosure once the plan is fleshed out, but should the district want that level of transparency? I have a petition here signed by over 180 people who do not support this shell proposal. If you read the petition, you'll find that most of my reasons for not supporting the proposal are simply questions. I met with the district hoping to get answers. I did not because there is no plan from which to get them. John Wayne once said, a friend of mine told me to shoot first and ask questions later. I was going to ask him why, but I had to shoot him. Here, we are shooting first and asking questions later. We should be asking and asking, or asking and answering questions first. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Proctor. <clears throat> I believe this next card is from Ann Son, Sone, S O N N E. Sorry. My name is Ann Sani. I seven of my grandchildren attend Coronado schools. Yesterday, a board member stated that to date, based upon the letter she had received, she had not heard one compelling reason to not go forward today with a proposal to move six classes of kindergartners from ECDC to Village Elementary School. This afternoon, I'd like to list four compelling reasons you should not vote today to move all kindergartners from the ECDC site to Village Elementary. Compelling reason number one, you have not involved the community in making this decision. The public found out about this idea in the same way we found out about the dog park idea. The board actually scheduled a vote on this before sharing information with the public and without soliciting input from parents and teachers and staff, the people who will be affected by uprooting and moving six or seven classes of kindergartners from ECDC to Village Elementary. Compelling reason number two, you have not addressed expected consequences of this decision. I have seen no evidence that you've considered the cumulative environmental impacts of changing ECDC's use and transferring 150 kindergartners to a new facility. For instance, are you aware that there are 10 endangered species in the areas of these two schools? How will the increased traffic, noise, population of both sites jeopardize their habitats along with the students? How will you deal with potential overcrowding? Previously, the district moved the kindergarten to ECDC to solve this problem. In the future, will you put portable classrooms on the playgrounds or move kids to Strand? Class sizes are already too large. Doesn't this plan that limits space ensure that class sizes will always be maxed out? Compelling reason number three, you have not explained why this is the only feasible solution to budget problems. Are there other ways the district could save money without moving students and impacting class sizes? At the very least, alternatives should be identified and explanations provided to the public about why they won't work. Compelling reason number four, you have not given a clear explanation of how this decision is going to benefit the students. School boards should be in the business of providing the best education possible to students. Budgetary solutions that are not in the best interest of students are not solutions at all. I read in the Eagle that a board member identified big costs as the reason the board must look to efficiencies or other ways of raising revenue, quote, such as dogs and moving kindergartners, unquote. A governing entity that equates dogs and children in its search for budgetary solutions has lost sight of its fundamental objective. I have given you four compelling reasons to delay a vote on moving kindergartners from ECDC to Village Elementary. I ask that you you take more time to work out the numbers and goals and specifics of your proposal before you vote to move the kindergartners to village. I ask that you include parents and kindergarten and village teachers and staff in this process. I ask that you then host informational meetings for all parents and interested community members to attend before making such a big decision that would affect so many people. Thank you. Thank you. I have a card from Ms. Ingo Hart. Mr. Ingo Hart? What is it? Mr. Ingo, sorry. So, um, I don't even know what to add anymore because a lot of good things have already been said. Um, my wife made me come, in a way, because I feel that my children are going to be fine no matter what, what, what you decide to do because um, 
these schools are great. But the other thing that I do know is they're going to be fine at the place where they're right now, even though they're fine going to be going to village. Um, so what this is all about is not whether the children are fine, which is all that the report is talking about, is whether this is good for the children and whether the children are better off there or better off at the other school. I, I read the report and I was trying to figure out um, why you're doing this. It, the report doesn't talk about what your goals are. The report talks about why the children will be fine once they transition to the new school, but not why you're doing it. What are you trying to achieve? Um, the, the report is absolutely not helpful, and, and, and other people have already said that. I have to make decisions all the time in my job. If somebody presented me with a report like the one that I've read to, to support the move of the school, I would say go back and start from scratch. There's no data, there's no goal, no objective, no weighing of options. It's, it's completely as if you've already made your decision, and it's just justifying a decision already made. Um, now, you haven't stated the goal, but I have to assume it is for money, and you're trying to save money. The, the report doesn't state what has caused any kind of budget deficit, what problem in terms of money you want to solve. Um, and you're choosing Village Elementary as a target when Village Elementary is the lowest rated school in your, in your school district. It doesn't explain why you're choosing Village. Um, and. I have to assume that you're choosing village because it's the easiest target. As a, it has the lowest number of students. It has students that cannot speak for themselves. And if you try to do that at, at the high school, you have a high school representative here. There's seven, that I think there's a thousand people at the high school. A thousand students could speak up about a program that's being cut at a high school. Here you have 150 students that cannot talk for themselves and parents of 150 students. Much easier target. Um, the, the report doesn't provide any information to make any kind of informed decision. It's, it's what are you going to do with the cost savings, where are the cost savings are going to come from, how does it improve the education of my children once they move. Um, the report makes clear that the children are going to be fine um, um, where they're going, but it doesn't make clear that they're going to be better off at Village. Um, it's, it's what makes me wonder why our children have to pay a price for some kind of mismanagement that happened at the school. And I would like to remind Mr. Pontus that in an interview in, in August, he stated that when keeping the pool, we're not closing any programs. You are closing this school. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Tom Proctor. One of my main concerns, which has already been alluded to, is that adding 125 to 150 new students to Village, Maine, will result in overcrowding and a reduction in resources for all students. After all, ECDC was built in the first place because Village, Maine got too crowded. In 2003, enrollment at Village, Maine was 827 students. There weren't enough classrooms. Some parents were told that their kids would have to be shipped down to Strand Elementary. Predictably, this led to an uproar, and the district created multi-grade combination classes to avoid having to send villages, village students to Strand. In 2005 and 2006, ECDC was actually built to alleviate this problem of overcrowding. Currently, enrollment between village and ECDC is approximately 840 students, more than it was in 2003 when there was overcrowding. If an enrollment of 827 students led to overcrowding in 2003, why wouldn't it lead to overcrowding today? What has changed? How will it not lead to a reduction in services and opportunities for all students? I have heard that the district can exercise some control over enrollment by decreasing inter-district transfers, but it can't reduce them by much. If it did, it would lose a significant chunk of revenue, which would negate the savings that seems to be the primary driving force behind this proposal. So again, if 827 students led to overcrowding in 2003, how would it be different today? Even if the district limits transfers, what happens if a new aircraft carrier is stationed in Coronado and suddenly we have a wave of 75 new students at Village, which happened in 2009 and led to ballooning enrollment for five years? Do we want to depend on cramming the maximum number of students allowed in each classroom to fit all students at Village? 
when there is a perfect $6 million facility that was custom built for kinder kindergartners right down the street. Unfortunately, the proposal does not address this overcrowding issue, just like it does not address several other negative ramifications of this move, and just like it does not address some of the great things about ECDC that will be lost if this, move, if this proposal is approved. Yesterday, my wife, her sister, and I met with Superintendent Muller and a couple of members of the school board. Uh, I want to thank them publicly for taking the time to meet with us. We do appreciate that. During our meeting, I expressed my concern that the proposal was biased and did not present an objective, neutral analysis of the pros and cons of a move, including overcrowding. The response I got was that it was not the district's responsibility to present an objective analysis to the board. Rather, it was the board's responsibility to ask tough questions to ferret out these issues. Frankly, that response surprised me, and I'm still surprised by that response. But whether the district has a responsibility to the school board or not, I think that the district and the school board have a responsibility to the public. We deserve to know, we deserve a balanced objective analysis of the proposal. Summarize in 10 seconds, please. So that we can understand the pros and cons of this proposal, so that we can determine for ourselves that this is really the best thing for our children. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, we had one more card come in, so we're a little bit ahead, so we'll be fine. Uh, two more cards, Mr. John Romer. Well, we've got some good speech writers. Maybe I should have asked some of them to help me with my comments. Um, we were all bewildered as to why this proposal was coming forward, but I figured out why. It has nothing to do with wanting to improve the education of the kindergartners. It has nothing to do even with money and finances. What it has to do with is wanting to expand the preschool. For whatever reason, this district has gotten its priorities all mixed up. Now it believes it's more important to run a nursery school than to run a high school. I've been told that this district considers itself to be the experts on preschool education. The truth is, financially speaking, you're the worst preschool operators I've ever seen. According to your June 30, 2018 audited financial statement, your preschool had an operating loss of $186,000. In spite of every advantage, you've managed to bungle this. I warned the district back when it was first proposing its preschool pipe dreams that it wouldn't be able to do so with a profit. But even I didn't think you could bungle it this bad. You want to fix your finances? Last time I gave you an offer of $300,000. I've looked again. I forgot you had two classrooms devoted to Crown Preschool. I can offer you $500,000 every year. Your financial problems are solved. You're welcome. But I know you don't care, because for whatever reason, this district has an egomaniacal obsession with running a preschool, believing it's the salvation of preschool education. This plan is throwing the kindergartners under the school bus to make space to expand the preschool. So I've still got a few minutes. 500000 close your Crown Preschool. That'll stop the $186,000 a year operating loss. Fill that up with school-age kids, including inter-district transfers. You should easily be able to clear $300,000. It was always a financial mistake for this school district to get into the preschool business because it has the much more lucrative option of bringing in inter-district transfers that pay better. And it's simple arithmetic. Preschool, the ratio, student-teacher ratio is limited to 12 to 1. That's mandated by the state. With school-aged children, you can have 25 to 1. You tell me, which can you do better with financially? The answer is obvious. So let's not throw the kindergartners under the bus. Let's make a decision that actually makes sense financially. I even saw in your report you were thinking of infant care. You know what the ratio is for that? One to four. You'll never make any money. And that's my time. Thank you. 
All right, a couple of cards got stuck together here. Miss Jane Mitchell. Hello. I have a daughter who's in uh, kindergarten, and I'm so glad that I was able to uh, have her go to the same school, essentially, that I went to. I grew up here, and I went to the original Crown School, first through sixth grade. Kindergarten, I was in a private school in Guam, but when we returned home here, the kindergarten was set up, and they had a separate area that really, as I see now as a mother, is such an important thing to have the kids at this young, tender age have a, an area which is separate um, from sort of the chaos that I think happens once you hit first grade. I've already seen uh, how she has and the other kids evolve from just starting kindergarten on. These are the types of things that I think are getting lost. They're getting lost in bureaucracy, in um, in la a lack of transparency, perhaps someone used the term ego, and it's just interesting to me to watch absolutely no expression from any of the board members as anybody up here is speaking. I'm, I sent an email today to all of you. I'm just going to read a couple of things. My biggest question is transparency, and everyone has hit on that, and that makes me so glad to know that that is something that everyone cares about. I want to know what's the process been to get to this recommendation. What is the urgency to approve such an approval? Will you address all of these questions, not just with lip service, but, but with complete and accurate information, even if it does not support your idea, which in the end would then cause you to say, let's not do this. This is public money, due dil diligence is an obligation and your responsibility. Even approving a study to thor thoroughly review and take the pulse of the community would be a much better idea than just jumping into this. My dad served in the Navy 30 years. They moved to Coronado and bought homes in 1959. Actually, they were here in 1947 because they knew the schools were good. My dad hated the beach, but they knew the schools were good. And all four of us graduated from Coronado High School. I am now raising my daughter here. We have a track record of kiddos, and we all want the best thing for them. This is not, not only not the right thing, it's not the right thing if you have not done your due diligence. I hear that this is a done deal from some insiders. Nothing should be a done deal. And I think the presence here of these people and the publicity that you're going to get is going to not look very good for you all or for our community. And lastly, I've heard that, you know, if it's about the money that you want to rent out that space in order to get money some other way, that's a really bad reason for this. So let's do your due diligence, do right by the community, be transparent, and let's do the right thing for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. <laughs> the last card is from uh, Ms. Andrea Gonzalez. So I have two children here, and I live here in Coronado, and one of my kids, I actually interdistrict transfer him out because of the quality of the schools here. I just found out about this like three days ago, and I was like, gee, I would have liked to have time to have put something together because I have been a clinical social worker now for 16 years, and eight of those is specializing in the early childhood development and mental health of children zero to five. So yes, that includes infants, preschoolers, and and kindergartners and without a good preschool without a good TK you don't get kindergartners so while I understand the importance of needing that revenue and I do understand the importance of needing a preschool I also understand the importance of having a good kindergarten now why is my child not in kindergarten I wish that I had been more prepared so I could show you neuro scans and I could quote all the studies off of the top of my head because I'm a program manager at a clinic for children with disabilities and emotional issues for zero to five. But instead, I come to you as a mom. My kid had a really high IQ, and there was not enough space when it came time to TK, so they put him in with the kindergartners. And that was already here at ECDC, and that was only three to four years ago. Four moms complained. They called me. Why they called me? I don't know. But they called me to complain. I was the only one who was okay with it because I was like, you know what? My kid's going to be bored. Might as well be in with the kindergartners, learn what they have to know. However, 
even with the class sizes that they tried with to have that were appropriate for TKers and preschoolers, they missed my son being neurodivergent, that he had a sensory processing issue. He graduated TK reading at the first grade level, but basic things like being very sensitive to hearing went completely missed. I had to put my kid through two evaluations and it was still missed. And I wonder now when I call Village to find out how big are the class sizes now, because now I'm thinking, well, my kid's in second grade, soon he'll be in third, it's time for gate, where am I gonna put him? I'm interviewing private schools. And they're like, we don't have gate. We don't have anything, we'll just tailor curriculum. The school sizes here are 26 to 30. Meanwhile, my kid goes to National City where the poverty level is at 78%. He has air conditioning and they do have gate and he's learning two languages. So why is it that my daughter that I had to spend six months getting speech therapy for here from the district should not be shipped out outside of the island even though I went to school here my husband was born here my mother-in-law taught here my father-in-law was on the school board here why am I going to send my kids to National City and not Coronado let's think about that before we talk about ratings Uh, this is uh, this was an agenda item. If any uh, board members wish to make comments on any of the comments they've heard, or you can take them and hold them until we get to our discussion. Otherwise, I'll call Superintendent Mueller. Mr. Mueller, I have a presentation for us today. Thank you, Captain Pontes, Governing Board. Um, thank you to the community members who have spoken and who are here uh, to participate in this evening's um, board meeting. Big picture, what is the proposal before the board this evening to integrate TKK with Village Maine in order to prioritize programs, services for students and staff by drawing down operating costs and optimizing services? Why centralize and optimize services for these young students, increase in cl collaboration for our education professionals across elementary continuum, maximize resources, including administration, which currently divides time between the two campuses, and to help reduce our structural deficit. Some of the guiding principles of our long-range plan are aligned with this proposal. We will base decisions on what is best for all students in our district, always. We will prioritize physical and emotional safety of our staff and students. We will adhere to our fiduciary responsibility for budget stability and in order to sustain programs and supports which enrich students' experiences. What are some research-based instructional benefits? Uh, as you know, we're currently going through two pilots for elementary curriculum, both in English language arts, or oh, English language arts will start next year, currently with math in our Bridges program. Implementation of new curricula and coordinated curriculum taught with fidelity across the TK through fifth grade continuum is important for staff to be able to um, increase opportunities uh, for fidelity checks that create open communication and productive feedback by providing teachers with frequent and ongoing opportunities to learn and collaborate. Consistent supervision of curriculum implementation, ensuring that the most effective components of the evidence-based practice is implemented, implemented, thus directly impacting the success and desired outcomes. Having all of our teachers together as we roll out a coordinated and uh, a new curriculum that's taught with fidelity, meaning every teacher, every grade level. It's important for those professionals to have opportunities to collaborate frequently, regularly, um, authentically and organically, and for the administrative team to help monitor the implementation of those programs. Staff collaboration and academic support, supports and enrichment. I mentioned some professional learning advantages. Increased staff interaction and collaboration can more easily track development of students over long periods of time and actively share strategies and awareness of student strengths and needs as they progress through school. Intervention and enrichment, increased access to research-based academic interventions and enrichment opportunities. A lot of this came from an instructional minutes study that the governing board asked staff to take place in. Uh, we looked at neighboring districts, Encinitas, Carlsbad, Poway, National School District, and we looked at what are the average instructional minutes per grade level in comparison to our TK through fifth grade program. 
understanding Assembly Bill 197 is pushing schools to align kindergarten instructional minutes with pupils in first grade. If we're gonna increase instructional minutes to support the adoption of new curriculum, having those teachers together for that adoption, we believe will be incredibly beneficial. You can see the instructional minutes on the left from neighboring districts and our current instructional minutes on the right. We've come up with some draft bell schedules, looking at the neighboring districts that I just mentioned to show how as 93% of elementary schools in neighboring districts are either TK through fifth, TK through sixth, or two, TK through eighth grade, how they can coordinate resources like recess, physical education, lunch, enrichment and intervention experiences while sharing space with their fourth and fifth grade counterparts. We've also sampled neighboring districts and best practices for intervention and enrichment schedules. We need time to develop these. I'd like to ask and celebrate the governing board's, board's wisdom and foresight to postpone this proposal from school year 1920 to school year 2021 in order to work with our staff to come up with what will that bell schedule look like. It's a complicated matrix, but there are many, many best practices in our region and across the state that have robust intervention programs, enrichment programs uh, that fit within a bell schedule and can accommodate TK through fifth grade students. Safety and support. I've heard from teachers in this room the need to have and a presence a regular presence of administration and counseling on that campus. Currently, our administrators and our counselors are not on an as-needed basis. They travel that 0.5, that half a mile, daily back and forth to support the needs of our staff and our students, oftentimes in response or in reaction to a behavior intervention or a student in crisis. Programs and resources, what do we believe will benefit our students from this move that currently does not exist on the independent TKK, a broader continuum of services for special education students on the main campus. Currently, we don't have a staff member or separate setting for pullout services at ECDC. Administrative support, academic support and enrichment, we do not have a designated ACE program on the ECDC campus. As needed counseling services, our current Best Buddies program, we have groups of students walking from Village Elementary School down to ECDC for a reading program. The students love it on both ends, but the lost instructional time for those students to commute a half a mile down and back to participate in this program would be cut significantly if they shared a campus. The elephant in the room, what a lot of our speakers have been discussing is our budget reality. Our reality is we're spending more annually than we receive. We are not alone. This is not because of a, a mistake in accounting. This is not because of mismanagement. This is because the state of California provides us with inadequate funding to educate our students. Coronado Unified School District are losers in the local control funding formula. The school district that was mentioned earlier by one of our speakers, they have high concentrations of unduplicated pupils and receive upwards of $1,800 more per student than we do. That, those resources make a significant difference in the services that we can provide. <clears throat> our structural deficit next year is projected to be $1.1 million. That's expected to grow as expenditures continue and outpace revenues. We know we don't have control over the funding that we receive, but we do have local control on how we allocate resources in those dollars. With no changes to our current budget deficit, we'll be insolvent in 24-25. I mentioned basic aid here because we know as a community that basic aid is on the horizon. We cannot coast into basic aid with a, 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 a revenue in our reserves of only 3%. Basic aid districts need to be cash heavy. They're only funded twice per year when tax allocations are sent to the school district. Local control funding formula districts are funded and those apportionments come in 12 installments. They come monthly. Basic aid districts receive more funding because the community tax dollars stay in the community, but you need to be cash heavy when you get to basic aid. 
I've heard a lot about enrollment and capacity and that we haven't taken a critical look. I'd like to share with our community, current enrollment at Village, including ECDC, is 826 students. In 2014, there was a facilities master plan that was conducted that stated the site capacity for Village Elementary was 988 students. We will never, ever ask the governing board to put our students in a position where they're one of 988 students. I do want to share that class sizes are governed by this body through the collective bargaining agreement. Those are negotiated. As you see, our current class size averages either fall under the target in the TK through first grade band and in the fourth and fifth grade band, and we are 0.3 students over in our second and third grade band. These numbers are important to us because this is how we provide a quality education for our students. So that's our current role, enrollment and capacity. Projected enrollment for 1920, next school year, if we made no changes, no new families moved in and we didn't accept inter-district trans transfer students, we would open with 750 students at both sites, TK through fifth grade. Given our collective bargaining agreement and our class size targets, without making any changes, having five grade levels or five classrooms at each grade level and a transitional kindergarten class, we still have room for 88 students if we wanted to fill those classes to the capacity that our collective bargaining agreement allows. That's not our interest. And this is why. Our current enrollment and in interdistrict transfer numbers at Village Elementary, we have 826 students at Village Elementary. Nine and a half percent are interdistrict transfers. As many of you know, basic aid districts are funded through local property taxes, not enrollment. Filling our schools with IDTs was a way for us to sustain programs, and our IDT students bring so much to our school community. They bring diversity, they bring grit, they bring perspectives that really enhance the experiences that our students take away, but we've also used them to help offset our budget. When we become a basic aid district in 2025-26, we are no longer dependent on interdistrict transfer students to sustain our staffing or the programs that we offer our kids. Facilities, we discussed this at the February 14th meeting, and again, I appreciate your wisdom in postponing this proposal for a year for planning and for study. Um, I wanted to show our community again that our classrooms at all three sites are aligned with the requirements that the Ed Code has laid out for square footage in classrooms. This is the Early Childhood Development Center. Looking at this picture on the top of the screen, those seven classrooms represent one TK, one TKK combo, and five kindergarten classrooms. After the third building, you see a restroom, and on the edge, you see a second restroom facility. This is a beautiful facility. This is our current Village Elementary School. That's the layout, that's the footprint of Village Elementary. Again, the master plan, the facility study in 2014 said we could accommodate 988 students. This is the proposed pod, the 700 pod for our TK and K classrooms. It's a self-contained building. It can be secured from the outside. It has a courtyard. Teachers in those classrooms can watch their students seamlessly pass from classroom to classroom. There are restrooms in a majority of the classrooms, so students aren't leaving the classroom to use the restroom, and they have access to our library, and currently our visual and performing arts, computer lab, and ACE supports are directly above our library. Next steps. We realize the community has questions regarding this proposal and logistical concerns, and we're committed to actively engage our shareholders in the planning discussions. We're not eliminating programs or services, we're consolidating for operational efficiencies. We're committed to providing a quality education, but we'll deliberately prioritize safety and success of our students' programs and staff over our facilities. It's our people and it's our teachers that make CUSD an exceptional school district, not the facility in which they teach. A proposed timeline. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. If approved, starting this month through June of 2019, we'll start a planning phase with our staff. Using the draft, what, we're all, what may our bell schedule look like? What will ACE supports look like? 
What were all facilities? Where will we shuffle um, resources to ensure a very effective and efficient flow for all of our students? What are the logistics? In the summer of 19, we're gonna start preparing Village Elementary for TK and K. The 700 building, enrollment adjustments, looking critically at our inter-district transfer approvals, and purging surplus materials and supplies. Village Elementary has been around for a long time. I've done countless walkthroughs. We have a lot of space currently occupied with materials and supplies that our district has already surplused. We just haven't gotten rid of them. Fall 19 and spring of 2020, so next school year, we're really gonna get into the work. The renovations, the cosmetic work that we want to do for all of our classrooms and all of our students, and then taking action and planning for some of the changes that our planning committee has determined would help support these transitions. And then to start our community forums. The summer of 2020 would be the move. Moving TK and K furniture and instructional materials from Village, Maine and helping set up those classrooms. The first day of school, August 28th, 2020, for a TK through fifth grade Village Elementary School. Breaking those down, a little bit more detail, March through June, some of the work that our committee has to take place in, what is our staggered start and stop time with Coronado Middle School and Coronado High School? Both of those schools are engaged in bell schedule studies and committees as we speak. And adjusting those instructional minutes, what are our competitors doing? How are we aligned with best practices in our county and beyond? What will our recess, what will our recess lunch, and PE scheduling look like? How can we reconfigure ACE and our wheel programs and supports to best meet the needs of our students? What are other programs, resources, and supports that we need to put in place during this planning? And then logistical. We have suggestions from the Coronado Police Department on a traffic, both vehicle and pedestrian study. What does that mitigation report suggest we put in place prior to 2020 doing that work? Pick up drop off procedures and scheduling again with those three schools in the main village. The summer of 2019, relocation and repurposing of our existing classroom spaces, lab spaces, et cetera, and starting to do facilities work where needed. Phase two, making sure we have a critical eye on our enrollment and the, the role that our inter-district transfer students will play to maximize our FTE to ADA ratios while ensuring we're preparing for a potential influx of TK and K students. How are we starting to calibrate our enrollment through the inter-district transfer process? Taking, taking action on our bell schedule and logistical studies, calibrating instructional minutes, ACE specials, PE, et cetera. Again, continuing working on that 700 building to prepare for this and then to begin with our community forums, to present the work of our staff on bell scheduling, drop off, pickup, traffic, and other logistical changes that will come with this, and then to explore what is the future use of ECDC. Phase three, the summer of 2020, we would be busy moving the TK and K classrooms to Village, Maine, and rolling out our new elementary bell schedules. It's the recommendation of staff and the superintendent that the governing board approve the proposed integration of transitional kindergarten and kindergarten students back to the main campus at Village Elementary School, effective school year 2021. I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Mueller. Any board members for questions for Mr. Mueller? Uh, Mr. Mueller, thank you for your report. Um, I have heard concerns about safety and um, the influence of 10 year olds on the youngsters. Are there any instances that you know of where the children are unsafe at Village Elementary? The, the normal interactions of students at any school can pose safety concerns. Looking at the model that we have in our district of kindergartners and fifth graders at Silver Strand and at neighboring schools across the bridge that have similar enrollments, uh, the interactions between the youngest learners and the oldest learners are intentional and purposeful. They stagger recess, they stagger lunch, and they stagger experiences. So when there are interactions between our oldest and youngest students, they're intentional, and they're through a best buddies or a mentoring type program. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, I'll have one question. Mr. Mueller, in your opinion, 
If we accept a recommendation and approve the uh, proposed integration of TKK down to Village Elementary School, will those students continue to receive an equal or better education and remain safe and secure at that site? I believe for the reasons that I listed, as we transition and implement uh, new programs and fine tune and revamp our existing resources and enrichments, that our TK and K will have access to additional resources and supports. I believe that they will receive an equal or better education. And uh, if we did nothing, we'd have to look for efficiencies in other places, obviously, but if we did nothing, the district would have no reserves in what, in what time frame? I'm sorry, sir, can you repeat that? I, if I we did nothing, if we made, if we did not uh, accomplish this transition, if we did for no other efficiencies, at what point would the district reserves be dried up, be gone? Assuming there are no other changes, um, we would become insolvent in the 2024-25 school year. Or we would be looking at um, targeting other programs or resources for students across our district to identify and locate those efficiencies. And there, there's no additional help coming from the state and any of the programs that we've seen so far, correct? Not that we're aware of. Thank you. President Pontus, can I just ask you a favor? Can you please um, ask our audience to have respect? This is the time that the board has discussion, and it's a little bit um, distracting to have a, and a completely other conversation going on right here in front of us. All right, apologize for that. I'm 25 years of aviation, there's only much for my hearing. I did not hear any of those conversations, but obviously you did. So yes, please, if you would, uh, uh, while we're running our meeting here, this is a board meeting held in a public place, uh, but it is our meeting. So yes, please uh, be mindful of uh, what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, Russell. I had the opportunity to um, go ahead and look at the village proposed site of where the kindergarten would be along with many of the other board members and there were definitely a plenty of, of classrooms and so forth. If we were not to move forward with this, are there any plans of separating the kindergartners at Silver Strand? There are no plans to separate kindergartners. Because it seems to me that if it was so valuable to have village separated, we would need to do that at Silver Strand as well. There are no plans to do that. I Ms. Have, uh, Valdez? I have uh, several questions, but I know in interest of parliamentary procedure, I'm, I'll ask one and then allow the rest of you to ask several questions. But I just wanted to go back to several speakers. And um, just for the record, we read every single comment. We're taking notes. And just out of objectivity, we're conducting this fully and transparently. Nobody has colluded. I don't know how my peers are going to react or vote. This is all as we go along completely um, extemporaneous. So I'm taking notes. Um, superintendent and there's been various concerns of environmental concerns um, I like dogs I was a community member the board member that said about the dog part and brought up the other solutions that we've entitled I love dogs I'm a dog owner and I love children I'm also a mom so um, so I'm interested in the endangered species that one of the speakers brought up um, and also the noise and the potential community impact especially for that concourse and the streets involved is there an environmental impact impact report that will be or needs to be prepared? We will, we will reach out to council. Um, uh, the first issue or the first concern that we raised with council, we did not believe we needed to, but um, I was unaware and, and am unaware of endangered species that may be impacted here. Uh, so if it's the direction of the board, we will include in our planning phase an EIR report and take guidance from council. Thank you. Does anyone else have another question? Continue. Just to piggyback on, on that, um, because speaking of environmental um, impact on our on these two sites, that site was built originally for kindergarten, and it did have kindergarten there at one time. So there, there's we're not doing anything new, and we're not building anything, correct? That was our understanding when we initially posed this to council. But if it's the will of the board, we'll go back to council with um, new information um, to verify that we're not in out of compliance with any environmental impact uh, issues that may surface as a result of this move. But again, we believe as, as the students are transitioning from one site to the other, we're also going to be decreasing enrollment 
Um, so I, I don't know if that report would be directly tied to enrollment or the age of the students joining the school. I have one other question. Can we pull up the slide with regard to um, the elephant in the room, I think that you titled it, uh, with regard to our um, current budget situation? There we go. Um, one of the one of the speakers, uh, I believe Mr. Romer, I believe, he's been a speaker on this issue twice, and the obvious question is why not just close the preschool? Why is that not a solution instead of, and why move the kindergartners? So in reading the preliminary proposal to the governing board um, to add a fee-based preschool, uh, it was in part to provide a service to the community of Coronado to have those facilities here. Um, as far as the $178,000, I will ask uh, Mr. Salamanca if he's willing to address the, uh, the claim made by the gentleman who um, has spoken from the uh, Baptist preschool. Thank you, Mr. Mueller. Um, in fact, I've had an opportunity to uh, speak with that gentleman um, at length uh, at the last, the day of the last board meeting, um, and I was able to clarify that the Crown Preschool, uh, in fact, does not uh, operate at an annual deficit of $160,000. Um, yes, it's on the audited financial statements as of June 30. Um, I'm a CPA by trade, so uh, I understand that there are new accounting pronouncements that require school districts to recognize the pension liability and other post-employment benefit liabilities on our books locally. Um, as you know, our school district and school districts across the state participate in uh, the uh, STRS and PERS employee pension um, retirement funds. Um, the reason that the, that financial statement reflects a negative balance is that um, because of a new pronouncement, districts are required to recognize that liability at a local level even though um, we pay our fair share to the Persian Stirs funds um, on an annual basis, um, pay as you go. Um, so to characterize uh, ECDC as a money losing venture on an annual basis would be inaccurate. Um, in fact, um, I'll, we'll have an opportunity later to look at our uh, proposals or at our, our budget um, later on this evening. We can clarify that um, in more detail, but um, the number that was presented is, is not accurate. In addition, the, the information presented from the gentleman from the Baptist Preschool stated an alternative would be to increase interdistrict transfers. I'd like to remind the board um, again that when we reach basic aid, our enrollment will not drive funding in our district. So ADA uh, will no longer be how we're funded, will be funded locally through property tax. So increasing enrollment through interdistrict transfer students for ongoing costs uh, may be effective for a few years. Um, but once we become a basic aid district, uh, those students are ours and we're not being funded through the local control funding formula, only through our local property tax. I just have a question and that is, um, I know transparency was brought up many times. Um, did you post um, information online that answered some questions that were brought up and did you turn anyone away or your staff who had some questions uh, as far as making time available? So I, I think it's fair to share with the governing board um, that we've received email and uh, verbal questions, um, concerns, and support for this proposal since it was initially presented to the board uh, in, a, in a January board meeting. Um, we had an opportunity to meet with our staff in late January, so all impacted staff met with us one afternoon in room 601 at Village Elementary School to discuss the implications of this uh, proposal. Um, we did hold a published workshop for the governing board to discuss this in February, and this evening we're presenting a more thorough plan, understanding that our planning will take place with staff. They're critical in the development of a final proposal that goes to the board that outlines our new bell schedule, how ACE supports will be provided, how we will stagger start and stop times to help mitigate traffic. Um, it's, been, it's been a challenge to keep up with all of the different questions, but the FAQ that we posted on our website uh, was in response to a lot of the misinformation about ballooning class size, um, about neighboring districts having these resources and to try to provide some clarification about where this proposal was coming from and where it wasn't. I have a question. 
Are teachers going to lose their jobs in transferring over? Oh. When we're looking at 2021, we will have staffing adjustments both to temporary uh, employees, contracted employees, through natural attrition this year. We believe that that pattern will continue during the 2021 school, 1920 uh, school year prior to 2021. We will always do our best to maximize our staffing to our student ratios. Um, we believe where those numbers in the February proposal were presented to the board, um, that was if we made this move today. Those were the efficiencies that we would recognize today. Uh, as we continue to move forward down this road, there will be other variables that change, including retirements from our district, including natural attrition, where we believe we will absorb our existing staff, both on the classified and the certificated size, uh, side of our of our, our labor associations and our colleagues as we go through this attrition towards basic aid. Thank you. Mr. Mueller, as we as you indicated, we have a you're requesting that uh, a planning phase be implemented from now to June and then uh, additional planning will continue beyond that. How do you envision uh, making your discoveries known to us as a board and to the public? If it's the will of the board, um, I would, I would uh, appreciate direction from the governing board to provide our community and uh, the five of you with regular updates on how those planning discussions are going, um, shareholders that have been involved on both the uh, integration of TK and K to Village Maine, but also um, listening to our community, surveying our community on uh, the future uh, space at ECDC that may become available if this move is approved. And if during the course of the planning, during the course of the implementation, if you come across items that make this look like a bad idea or things that may make it impossible to happen, or, or if at any time you believe that the children that we move, should we approve this item, the children moved would not receive an equal or better education or would not be safe for some reason, would you bring that recommendation to the board? Absolutely. I'm, I'm an educator. I'm a parent. Um, I'm, I'm not interested in compromising the safety or the success of my students. I come to work every day to support the safety and success of my students. My vision would be to have those reports provided by a member of our committee that is a certificated or a classified staff member, so the information is not just coming from the superintendent, but from members of our committee. Thank you. Any other questions, board members? Just I had a question about before and after care. Currently at ECDC, it is my understanding that they use the cafeteria. Uh, is there a cafeteria here? And or no, we use a cafeteria at a village, right? The, uh, for before village hall. Uh, village hall for after care. But if um, students get out early sometimes at ECDC, and children are there eating lunch. Is that in the plan for how to deal with before and after care students? Because that's important to working moms. Thank you, Dr. Anderson Cruz. Um, all of that information um, would be included in our planning study. Uh, as you note from the slide that says instructional minutes, uh, looking at comparison districts, um, we have a lot of discussion around our start and stop times and our instructional minutes. Uh, during the study, looking at eight or nine neighboring districts, we did. We did note that a majority of San Diego City schools or county schools offer full day transitional kindergarten, um, but all of those logistical things with start and stop times, aftercare would be part of our planning discussions over the next year. I have a question. Um, several of the community members um, have expressed safety concerns in terms of the drop off and the pickup. Um, having talked to, have you talked to the Coronado Police Department about this and what has been the response? Have they issued a report? Thank you. As, as Mr. Proctor uh, mentioned, we did receive uh, l last week uh, the traffic study from the Coronado Police Department. Um, it studied patterns in front of ECDC and in front of Village Maine and provided us with recommendations to help mitigate traffic during pickup and drop off. Um, if and when this proposal is approved to accommodate the additional vehicles and pedestrian traffic, that would be part of our study and part of any formal proposal to the governing board. Well, what we'll do if there, if 
there are no more questions for Superintendent Mueller, if there are no more comments on any of the public comments that were taken, then I think the next parliamentary procedure would be a motion, and then we can discuss and comment on the motion uh, if it is seconded, and then we can progress from there. Do you have something beyond that? Well, I'd like to have some discussion before we have a motion, because I, I think um, I want to talk about we might need to. Okay. What would you like to talk about? Uh, well, I just want to note to the community that um, tonight, this discussion that we're having here, this is not the extent of our discussion as a governing <coughs> team. Um, this is our actually our third public discussion of it, and we have had opportunity as governing board members to meet with staff. But in our, I believe it was the second um, discussion on this matter, we one of the concerns that was brought up was the um, ability or, and the safety and the emotional safety of kindergarten students on campus with 10th grade or 10 year old fifth grade students. Um, and I, I don't want to bring this up again. I, I don't necessarily want them to come up again, but I want the public to know that we have um, a principal, we have multiple principals and senior administrators in this district who have been principals in schools that have TK through five, TK through six students. And um, there is absolutely um, zero evidence that any TK or kindergarten student was ever endangered or otherwise harmed emotionally or socially by being on campus with, with fifth grade. I, I'm excited. Um, the work that both Village and Silver <coughs> Strand Elementary teachers have um, embarked on uh, this year and last year piloting at Silver Strand, the Sanford Harmony program, which is a research-based social emotional learning program um, that specifically talks about culture and community. It is a TK, actually a TK through sixth grade curriculum. And um, I know in conversations with both Principal Moore and Principal Bergener uh, that the Sanford Harmony program is going to continue as staff supplement those canned lessons with their own uh, classroom culture and community, um, but that will remain a focus to ensure the social and emotional uh, supports are in place for all of our learners. I just want to make the comment that I want to thank the people who came here tonight to speak passionately and to put different ideas out there that definitely I know speaking for myself and just knowing my own fellow trustees here that we are listening and we are taking notes. I think it was said eloquently by um, Trustee Valdez and there is no preconceived notion as said by um, Trustee um, Simon. Um, we come here with an open ear and I many times am almost disappointed that we don't get enough comment from the public. So thank you very much for making your presentations and also people who wrote the emails. Um, there were emails on both sides of this uh, discussion. So just because uh, one group is not as vocal does not mean that there is any um, counterpoint to that. But I have taken down notes and I believe that one of the underlying concepts that's resonating with me is this is being um, recommended by staff, including the teachers and principals, and that the focus is on improving all of our schools and systems. And I do believe that we have an opportunity here through this initiative to even improve more of our opportunities to improve that education for all of our students. And it was also pointed out by Trustee Ponith in his question to you that we're just going ahead. If there was ever anything that looked misguided, we would bring that to the table. So with that, I want to thank everyone, the public, who spent a lot of time on this. I know even drafting an email takes a lot of time. So thank you. I Thank you, Trustee Russell. I would like to note, like uh, the correspondences we've received from our community, we have also heard that there are there are staff members who feel strongly on on either side of this issue as well, um, and and all with valid points and concerns. Uh, but I do appreciate your comments and and echo your sentiment that the more public information we receive um, helps. Uh, helps us frame and guide our decision making and provide unique perspectives. Thank you. Minutes. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm done. Okay. Yeah. I thought I'm you were going to start timing me. Be great. To what we are now no. hearing. 
I have a question in addressing one of the public comments um, and that you're touching on right now. Um, what has been the feedback from administration? Right now I'm seeing people shaking their heads saying that staff is not on board with this or they are on board. Where he I'm hearing from you that they are on board. I'm seeing people shaking no, certain staff. So which is it? So as I just mentioned, there are staff members who feel strongly on both sides of this issue. I have heard directly from teachers within our district that they believe that this proposal is a no-brainer as it addresses, uh, helps to address our structural deficit, that there are efficiencies that can be identified. I've heard from teachers directly impacted that they agree that there are instructional and educational benefits to this move. I have also heard from teachers directly impacted by this that they do not support the initiative. And in fairness to those perspectives, I share with the board, we've received feedback on both sides. This is a difficult decision that I'm <coughs> placing before the governing board. Um, I don't think any of us appreciate the role or the position that we're placed in due to the inadequate funding that we receive. Um, and I can share that there are passionate opinions and perspectives on both sides of this proposal. Uh, perhaps more pointedly, is it a benefit to have an administrator on site at all times uh, for the staff? Yes. Staff impacted by this move over the last two and a half years have shared with me, and as recently as this week, that having an on-site administrator would support their efforts as educators in the classroom. Thank you. We had a speaker tonight, um, one that was bewildered um, that we were thinking of this, and one that had no idea where this had come from. Um, I think you articulated it in your, in your very comprehensive presentation, but I would just like to reiterate that the reason that we are looking at this is because we have a financial deficit. We deficit spend annually. So um, if you were bewildered or, or can't figure out why we're looking at this, I'm not sure where you've been um, for the last few years, but we, we have a funding issue in our district. Any other questions for Chip Jan Miller? I see people with their hands up. I could call on all these people. We could be here all night. This is a uh, board meeting that's being held in a public place. You've had your three minutes of three minutes of comments. We've taken all the yellow cards. We're not going to sit here and uh, exchange with the public all night. I'm sorry, we can't do that. Without prolonging the vote, why do it tonight? Why can't? Any other questions for Mr. Mueller? And can I? Can I? Please, we'll have order. We're conducting the meeting. Thank you. Um, can I just say that um, any of us up here right now can ask for uh, this motion to be or this item to be tabled? Um, I don't intend to do that, but any of us can do that. We are the only ones who can do that. Uh, Mr. President, can we add a motion to add 10 minutes to public comment? There seems to be a lot of people who want to say something. I don't think we lose anything with hearing from the audience for 10 minutes. I would present that motion to add 10 minutes to the public comment. That would allow for three speakers. And did uh, two other board members to jump on board with you? I'd be willing to do that, but uh, I'm not one of them. Any other board members wish to hear more public comments? I don't think we lose anything for 10 minutes. No. Nope. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? No further questions. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that being said, uh, do I have a motion? We should just stand up anyhow. Yes, I, I move to approve the proposal to relocate TKK from ECDC to Village, Maine in 2020 21. I'll second that motion. Um, I have comments. We're comments. I know we're comments. We've got time for comments. That's right. Comments. You first, Ms. Simon? Yes. Um, I just want to say that this governing board asked our superintendent to balance the budget and to keep us from insolvency. <clears throat> we're still deficit spending $1.1 million annually. So Mr. Mueller has his work cut out for him. <laughs> he can make cuts. He can find efficiencies. He can increase revenue. For those of you who might not realize, CUSD has made significant cuts since the beginning of the 2007 recession. Many of those cuts have yet to be restored. There's not a, left, a lot left to cut here in this district. 
And to be clear, I don't view this as a cut. Like the superintendent said, it's a consolidation of operational efficiencies. Village students will receive the same education that they did at ECDC and the same education that our Silver Strand TK and K teacher, or students receive. <clears throat> the powers that be in this district, the, 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 the leaders of our district, have sought every opportunity to increase revenue. From school bond measure Prop E, to lobbying for legislative change in LCFF, to creative use and rental of our facilities. If you didn't support Prop E, that's perfectly fine, but everyone should understand that just like we said there would be, there are consequences to that vote. Nobody in this community should be surprised that the mandate of Coronado's voters to live within our means includes some changes to business as usual. I commend the superintendent and his staff for coming up with this proposal that is really a significant step. It's not the solution to our budget problems, but it's a significant step in the right direction. Um, in the years I've been in this district, I've heard some truly alarming ideas to fix our budget shortfall, like closing Silver Strand Elementary, <clears throat> eliminating band, or performing arts, or high school sports, or our ACE programs, to name a few. In the umbrella vision of the district and the overall welfare of the 2,900 plus students that we serve, that are in our care, this relocation of classrooms is reasonable and well thought out in my opinion, and I'm ready to vote. I have a comment, but I believe Ms. Russell has a comment. Ms. Russell. My quick comment was that uh, saving money and that we have a budget deficit and so forth, yes, that is one of our bullets, but to me that's not the primary thing. I think the kids are gonna get a better opportunity to have more enriched education, that school was built for kindergarten, just like ECDC was. It's a return. Many people who have, have um, already had their children raised there, and there's no problem with that. If anything, I believe it's a safer environment if there was ever a lockdown situation needed. So although dollars and cents is part of the discussion, that does not come at the forefront of my mind when I make this vote. Thank you, Ms. Russell. Ms. Valdez. Um, my comment is simple. Um, we love kids. I love kids. That's why I'm serving here on the school board and safety and commitment to student education is primordial here. I think the um, red flag for me was uh, your presentation was that this school district that we all love will be insolvent at, by 2024-25. 20, and we just came back, uh, yourself included, from a legislative committee this weekend. Every single school district is wrestling with no money. And everybody thinks, oh, but this doesn't affect Coronado. Um, how many of us donate to CSF or went to Coronado's Got Talent? Yeah, a lot of us do because we see the need. It's very, very real. We see the need for our teachers. And I remember when we were negotiating for teachers' raises, the big thing for me that stuck was teachers make the difference. It's not the building, it's the teacher, it's the educator, it's the love that educates every single day. Um, the other thing that's sticking with me is that some of our administrators hadn't got a pay raise in four years, so we voted for a pay raise, that was 600,000. Our kids couldn't play sports and the roof was leaking because of all of the rain, that cost us 1.4 million. We're, our back is to the ropes right here. Um, nobody's coming to help, just other Coronadoans in the form of Coronado's Got Talent, CSF, and we're just, this is a proposal that we're going to either ratify or block. It's a proposal to move forward or not. I'm um, confident with the reports that I've heard, but we've also heard every single community member here. And again, I have to reiterate um, the budget situation where we're at. That's why other school districts get more money. That's why we don't get enough money. You know, and I'm of a demographic, I'm a minority, I went to Chula Vista School District. They get more money because of students like myself. I was a public school student. And they get more money because of the eight high demographic groups that, um, that get more money. We're in a different situation here. It's not fair, it's not right, and that's why I'm passionate about advocating for the school district that I love. And we take, we take heat when we meet with other people from school districts because we do go to bat for the school district. 
Thank you, Ms. Valdez. Dr. Cruz, tell me, Dr. Cruz, do you have any comments? You know, I recognize this is an emotional issue, and I, I just really want to thank the parents who stood up and, and talked and expressed themselves. We hear you. We are listening. Um, and as my fellow trustees said, our back is against the wall. If we go insolvent, moving ECDC won't be an issue because it won't be here. We won't be here. You know, I'm a grandmother of a village elementary student and the mother of a Coronado alumni, for whatever that's worth. Uh, so I'm very invested in our schools. I'm a retired educator. I love these kids and I care about them. And you may not always agree with our decisions, but it's the best decision that we can come up with right now. And we welcome you to join committees and help with the planning. And I appreciate that Superintendent Miller said, if it looks like it's going to be a bad idea, he's going to put the brakes on it. And you can trust us. I'm telling you, we are like watchdogs. We watch that budget. We watch what's going on. And even though you heavy sigh and shake your head at me, um, we'll be friends tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, I guess that just uh, leaves it for my comments. I would just, uh, for me, I apologize that we're even sitting here talking about this, but when the state funds us like the state funds us, we have to do some things differently than we've done in the past. As we've indicated, we're going to go uh, right after this, we're going to go into the uh, second interim budget. And if you turn to page 77 of 138, you'll see there that we're $1.692 million dollars in the red uh, next year. 600000 of that is to repair the roof and the turf. So we're overspent by about $1.1 .1 on an annual basis. That just can't go on. All right. So the question is, why, why are we attacking ECDC? I think that's the question on your mind. I don't think anybody, does anybody disagree that we have to do something? We cannot continue to spend it. A million dollars a year deficit. We'll be broke in 2024, and the state will come in and take us over. So we could do this. All right, so we don't go to ECDC and try to shut down the DCG. We can give those kids at ECDC an equal education in a safe environment, equal to what they're getting out, if not better. The other alternative is for us to go look all throughout the district and hit every kid, every program, every teacher, every staff member and ask them to give up something. We can die a thousand cuts. And if we do that, we will hurt other students. We will hurt staff. It will, it will not work. So I'm not one to die a thousand cuts. I think this is a good plan. It's got a lot of work to be done. As the other members have said, I appreciate your questions because your questions are going to drive the planning. All right. And you guys are sitting out there shaking your head. I can see it. We're doing it backwards, right? We're doing it backwards. All right? We are doing it because we've already delayed it a year. We would, if we were really, really interested in making it just a purely budgetary decision, we'd make it happen in the fall. But we have had enough foresight that we're postponing it for another year. It give you ample opportunity to make plans otherwise if you do not agree what we're doing. How about another month and give people a chance to listen to really what we've said tonight? There's a motion on the table. And a, and a second. second. All right. Go ahead and please vote. <laughs> Are we going to vote? And here's, here's what really gets me on this one, okay? Because I have received emails from any of you, and I've seen some of the names on the, uh, on the list, on the petition. Same names that asked me to increase teacher pay six months ago. Same names that asked me to approve the turf and the roof repair in the gym. Uh, but as soon as we try to find a way to make the efficiencies to make those things happen, then it's problematic. This is the best plan that we can come up with. Uh, it's the plan that I intend to go forward with. I intend to vote yes on this object, and that's the end of my discussion. Take a vote. Another comment? No. Any other comments? No. Call the vote, Ms. McGillicott. Motions approved unanimously. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you for your comments.